Caro Gesti, dear guests, my name is Tatiana Latinovic. I am the president of Icelandic Women's Rights Association, Quenrit in the Fjellag Eastlands. I want to welcome you all to this Kenya thing, uh, our annual gender congress that the uh, Icelandic Women's Rights Association has been organizing for five years now, since 20, uh, to, for the fifth time since 2018. The basic idea behind Kenya Think, Gender Forum, is to promote democratic debate and strengthen feminist diversity. It is the place where feminists in all shapes and forms come together to listen to each other, to learn from each other, to be angry, to be happy, to laugh together and have a good time and cry together. The agenda of today's uh, Kenya Think is organized uh, by grassroots organizations and is exceptionally versatile this year. I hope that you will all be inspired by something you hear today. And this year we have special guests with us here. We at the uh, Icelandic Women's Rights Association are honored to welcome our sister organization from Ukraine, the Ukrainian Women's Congress. We have organized the, their visit together in very good partnership with the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights of the Organization for Security Cooperation of Europe, which I really want to give thanks to. Ukrainian delegation has been here a few days, uh, packed with meetings, learning about Icelandic equality solutions, uh, and sharing experiencing and their knowledge they bring from their country with us, which is really, really tremendous uh, opportunity for us here. Uh, we, we heard today in a meeting from uh, uh, that, that how well organized civil society is in Ukraine, and this is something that we really can, you know, look look, look into uh, and and learn a lot. We also learned that women have been doing a lot, as we know that, that women do always. But it is uh, during the the, the 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 war that they are in. But it is a well known fact that position of women in war areas is particularly vulnerable, and we learned about that today. This is also the case in Ukraine. Uh, we applaud the tenacity of women working in feminist grassroots organizations under conditions that are unimaginably difficult. Uh, but one day, hopefully soon, this war shall pass too. It will end, and uh, reconstruction will begin. In societies where equality applies, people thrive. And so women and all genders must have a seat at any table where decisions are made. Uh, participation of women in post-war rebuilding process is the topic of this first session today of the two that Ukrainian Women's Congress is organizing. And I just want to say at the end that we feminists in Iceland and all Iceland will do our best to support your efforts and we're really, really looking forward to our further cooperation. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Irina Drobovic, uh, um, Ukrainian Women Congress Strategy Director, who is going to moderate this session, and uh, she will introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Tatiana, for uh, this short introduction, and thank you, the Icelandic Women's Rights Association, for the great partnership we have with the Ukrainian Women's Congress. We are here today, days before, to uh, exchange the experience on the best practices Iceland has in gender policies, but also to share our experience in uh, uh, providing equality under enormous security challenges. I hope this session will be very interesting for you, but before we have a special address uh, for our session, we have a special address from the Vice Speaker of the Department of Ukraine and co-founder of our Ukrainian Women's Congress, Olena Kodrytuk, who is doing a tremendous job both in Ukraine and abroad. In Ukraine, uh, Olena is promoting equal, gender equality policy and is traveling uh, uh, around the world with international advocacy on supporting both Ukraine and women's leadership. Olena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina. Dear colleagues, I will speak Ukrainian and the best interpreter, Irina, will help me. Yes, please take a translator. Шановні друзі, для нас сьогодні дуже важлива мить, тому що, дякуючи, до речі, Катерині Рябій, 
ми а, якраз започаткували можливість Українського жіночого конгресу. Це була, до речі, одна з її ідей. Я дуже рада, що сьогодні вона тут, і ми сьогодні можемо мати також наших друзів, а, з якими можемо розділити наші сьогодні і сподівання, і наші виклики, які стоять перед жіночим рухом загалом. І знаєте, що дуже приємно, що впродовж незалежності України ми святкували в минулому році 31 рік незалежності України. Так от, за опитуваннями Демократичного інституту, питання гендерної рівності стоїть най... з однієї найкращих реформ, яка була проведена за часів незалежності України. І це дуже і дуже відповідально, оскільки всі ми дотичні до цих процесів, що дуже і дуже приємно. І сьогодні, насправді, якраз разом зі мною всі ці мої колежанки, які доклали максимально зусиль для того, щоб гендерна рівність в Україні відбулася. Мені дуже приємно, що сьогодні разом зі мною є Марія Іонова, яка є теж депутаткою парламенту, вона буде мати окремо теж звернення до наступної сесії. Мені дуже шкода, що сьогодні з нами немає ще двох наших співзасновниць Світлани Войцеховської і Альони Бабак. Але оце якраз і свідчить про те, що жінки змушені поєднувати зразу декілька робіт одночасно, та, і вони просто не змогли сьогодні приїхати сюди, тому що мають важливі справи вдома, займаючись своїми родичами. Особливо зараз я вам хочу сказати, що для українських жінок це абсолютно нові виклики, які покликані з війною, яка відбувається в Україні. Насправді, війну ми маємо з 2014 року, але повномасштабне вторгнення, яке змінило повністю наше життя, розпочалося минулого року, 24 лютого 2022 року, і абсолютно змінило все в Україні. І самим нагальним, як на мене, зараз є процес, щоб ми не втратили тих темпів і тих можливостей, які були досягнуті з нами, починаючи з таких переломних моментів з 2014 року, з тих досягнень, які всі ми разом досягли. Сьогодні, говорячи про жінок в Україні, я би хотіла зосередитися на, основному такому, на основній такій тезі. Знаєте, в Україні прості жінки роблять надзвичайні речі. І я би хотіла сьогодні почати з історії абсолютно унікальних трьох жінок, Перша – це Світлана Попова, вчителька міста Бородянки. Бородянка – це 30 кілометрів від Києва, абсолютно невелике містечко, яке було попало під окупацію на початку вторгнення повномасштабного. Так от, вчителька математики Світлана Попова – Лишилася без, свого, без своєї школи, тому що її розбомбила російська ракета, і лишилася без свого будинку. Що вона зробила? Вона зробила просто-напросто, вийшла на вулицю, поставила дошку і почала вчити дітей в онлайн, ведучи безперервно свої уроки математики. Її син сфотографував і зробив вже потім відео з цих занять, воно почало бути вже вірусним. А ви можете теж з ним ознайомитися. І це свідчило лише про одне. Про те, що як Збройні Сили України захищають нашу незалежність і наш суверенітет, так само кожна вчителька докладає максимально зусиль, щоб наші діти мали можливість вчитись і мали можливість здобувати унікальні знання. Друга жінка, якою би теж хотіла поділитися історією, вона теж унікальна, тому що це Марія Ренчак, вона акушерка з Харкова. Харків потрапив теж під масивне бомбардування в лютому місяці. І ця жінка залишилася теж без своєї квартири, тому що квартиру в будинок її потрапила теж ракета. І вона не могла просто вже навіть виїхати за межі свого мікрорайону. Що вона зробила? Тому що вона розуміла, що поклик її далі треба йти на роботу. І далі разом зі всіма своїми колегами просто-напросто приймати роди тих жінок, які мали народжуватися. Тому що ці жінки теж не могли виїхати за межі Харкова, тому що зі всіх, зі всіх сторін він був в окупації. А мало того, вона прийняла роди і на світ народилося 12 дітей в Харкові. Саме завдяки їй. Це унікальна та жінка, яка 
подарувала можливість життя нашим українцям, які, я думаю, запам'ятають теж так, таку роль в історії. Я би дуже хотіла, щоб більше тих, про таких жінок знали в нас. І третю жінку, яку я би хотіла теж, я особисто з нею познайомилася, абсолютно унікальна. Це жінка Олена Швидка. Вона очолює невеличку, теж, невеличку громаду села Ягідне, яке потрапило теж під окупацію, воно в Чернігівській області. Мало того, саме в цьому селі, де вона є сільською головою та керівником громади, було вбито 360 людей. Вона залишилася своїми людьми, вона не виїхала. Мало того, вона залишилася там своїми дітьми. Абсолютно унікальна жінка, тому що якби ви побачили навіть зовні, як вона виглядає, невисокого росту, я би сказала, такої дуже статури, невеликої статури, та? але з неймовірним характером, з неймовірною волею до перемоги, з неймовірною наставництвом, яким вона мала. Мало того, вона могла об'єднати так своїх людей в селі, що жоден, як казав, навіть бачучи смерті, не боявся, що вони всі виживуть. І так і сталося. Звільнивши село Ягідне, ви знаєте, село Ягідне навіть потрапило було в журналі «Тайм» на обкладинку. Це а, якраз та унікальна можливість задуматися нам, що війна дуже близько. І що справжні цінності, які повинні ми зараз захищати, це справжні цінності людяності, гуманності і прав людини. Я думаю, що ми, коли говоримо сьогодні на нашій панельній дискусії про те, яку роль відіграють жінки в прийнятті рішень, так? то, як на мене, основне, ми можемо багато говорити про те, як змінилися жінки під час війни, наскільки вони можуть брати на себе додаткову відповідальність. Але я би хотіла тільки привернути вашу увагу до одного з опитувань ООН «Жінки» і організації КЕА, які вони провели в травні 2022 року. Так от, жінки зараз в Україні змушені брати на себе багато зразу ролі одночасно. Оскільки чоловіки воюють, вони е, розуміють, що можуть залишитися дуже часто і без годувальника в сім'ї. Тому вони одночасно беруть пару робіт. Мало того, в них є поклик до волонтерства, до виховання дітей. І це ті ролі, які просто нові, які вони змушені виконувати одночасно. Тому, коли ми говоримо про прийняття рішень, то перше, що ми повинні говорити про те, що така вже доля випала на українських жінок. Кожна на своєму місці, кожна докладає максимально зусиль, щоб їх діти, їхні сім'я були щасливою, відчували себе в захисті. Іра про це дуже добре знає, розуміє, тому що чоловік її воює. І я би хотіла, щоб ми сьогодні говорили все ж таки більше оптимізму, докладали би оптимістичних, та, тому що я думаю, що колеги можуть говорити багато про прийняття рішень, про резолюцію 1325, про всі рішення і резолюції Ради Європи і так далі. Але я би хотіла, щоб максимально більшість жінок, які приймають рішення і можуть впливати на рішення в країнах Європейського Союзу, ми можемо знайти багато прикладів успішних жінок, допомогли нам справитися з цією катастрофою, найбільшою катастрофою гуманітарною за часів Другої світової війни. Наші жінки зрозуміли одне, що вони можуть бути успішними в своїх професіях, вони можуть лікувати, вони можуть навчати, вони можуть приймати рішення в своєму бізнесі. До речі, в нас за час, за час війни жінки взяли на себе відповідальність і також і в малому і середньому бізнесі. Вони збільшили свою роль на 48%. Понад 450 тисяч жінок в Україні розпочали свій бізнес під час війни. Тобто вони просто розуміють, що тільки таким чином вони змушені виходити з цієї ситуації. Наші жінки – це понад 7,5 мільйони жінок з дітьми, зараз є в країнах Європейського Союзу. Я проїхала багато гуманітарних центрів минулого року в різних країнах Європейського Союзу. Я бачила плач, я бачила розпач. Я бачила, як жінки просто змушені тікати від війни, оберігаючи своїх дітей. В 
цьому році, коли я приїхала знову ж таки по цих країнах, оскільки ми маємо унікальну можливість зараз зустрічатися з людьми, які приймають рішення в країнах Європейського Союзу, докладаючи максимально разом з нами зусиль, що ми вступили до повноправними, стали членами Європейського Союзу і НАТО. Так от, зараз жінки в країнах Європейського Союзу, які перебувають вимушено і знаходять тимчасовий прихисток, відкрили бізнес в цих країнах. Понад 72% жінок пішли на роботу, вони знайшли цю роботу, вони використали цю можливість, яку їм дають ті країни, куди вони приїхали. Наші діти ходять в школи. Але я запевняю, що 90% цих людей хочуть повернутися в Україну. Але для того, щоб вони повернулися, ми повинні максимально доклати зусиль, щоб наші жінки і наші діти мали де працювати в Україні, мали де жити в Україні і мали де навчатися в Україні. І це величезний виклик зараз не тільки українських жінок, які приймають рішення, а це величезний виклик для всіх країн Європейського Союзу і світу. Тому що питання жінок, питання гендерного балансу, питання гендерних можливостей для жінок, вони пов'язані з системою безпеки в світі. Без системи безпеки в світі не буде реально рівних прав і можливостей. І як це парадоксально не звучить, сьогодні ми коли говоримо про гуманітарні питання, коли ми говоримо про прийняття рішень, всі ми кажемо про одне – що перемога в Україні можлива лише, коли в нас буде більше зброї, більше можливостей і більше максимальних зусиль в об'єднанні всіх нас для того, щоб зло було покарано, а добро перемогло. Дуже вам дякую за увагу. that 
that uh, Olena just mentioned, their personification of the fight for gender equality and the, the peaceful, sustainable, peaceful Ukraine. Uh, and I thought that, if I may, I will talk about equifinality. Equifinality is a, is a definition of different paths, different ways that one might take to get to the same goal. So as I've said, Iceland is already sad in its way. <laughs> However, yesterday we also learned that this is no paradox. Even in Iceland, there is no paradox that exists for, pa for feminists, for women, for the women's movements, for the women politicians, and uh, many, many, many <coughs> issues and challenges that, that Iceland has, Ukraine also has. And I can assure you, as our organization includes 57 participating states, many other countries are facing similar challenges. So, as you heard, I'm from Ukraine. And of course, when we talk about uh, how we can get to the goal of women and decision-making, gender parity, the military attack of the Russian Federation impacted that path in really many different ways because it shaped the lives of millions of Ukrainians, but it also impacted communities and lives of people outside of Ukraine. Because the war, or any war, not only war in Ukraine, but any war has no borders. And this is very important to acknowledge that Ukrainian women in this period have demonstrated leadership and a lot of strength, also delivering the message to the communities outside of Ukraine that these are the impacts that we need to deal with for our lifetimes. And this will impact engagement of women if we move forward with the gender equality agenda. So it altered our path. And 24th of February, of course, was a, was a day when the remarkable achievements of many women politicians, of civil society, uh, of, other, of international organizations that were present, they required, this day required that to understand and acknowledge that the gender roles are going to change for this period. And probably we would have to experience setbacks because this is not only uh, specific to my country, to our country, but to many other countries that lived through the war. Women take roles previously that were previously and historically were occupied by men, and then after the war, these roles remarkably are shifted back. If no work is, is if no work is done during the times of war, and it is very important because we talk about the role of women in decision making, about how to bring that the dream come true where women and men enjoy parity in decision making. It is very important to acknowledge that an important message to send is that all recovery, all recovery efforts, all, all gender equality efforts must continue during the times of war. And here, one very important challenge is the sexual and gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Because I really like to acknowledge this as a factor that is always on the way to women's empowerment. When I mentioned that it was, it was said to us multiple times yesterday that don't look for a paradise here. <laughs> it's not a paradise. And one figure that really impressed me that I couldn't imagine is true, is that 40% of Icelandic women in one shape or the other experienced violence here in Iceland that has been the leader in the fight for gender equality. And therefore, I really like to say that abolishing violence against women is a precondition. And we must remember about it every day when we address any discussion or have any discussion about women in decision making, politics, any other avenue where the decisions are made, having them, their voices heard at the table. And here, accountability is the second factor, accountability for war crimes. Because sexual and gender-based violence has been recognized as a form of torture. Sexual violence during the times of armed conflict is a war crime. Crime against, human, against humanity and also is recognized in the Convention of Genocide. This is a crime and accountability is so important to be done in real time during the times of war. The case is to be documented properly and brought to, and this case is to be brought to justice to rebuild confidence of women who have, played, who have been playing these important roles during the times 
of one hour to ensure that they will be willing to engage in decision making after the war. And as I've said, violence and any other factor that affects women during the war, any wars, makes women and girls more vulnerable. And these vulnerabilities, they, they, they are taking place now. They're around us. We see them. We might not acknowledge them, but they're there. And uh, for women to, after the war, to maintain their active role in decision making and securing this democratic future, which is an aspiration uh, for the country, is of paramount importance. And therefore, I can assure you that our office has been sending a strong message that democratic reforms need to continue during the wartime. We've been working on the legislation for political parties, and I'm sure that you've seen how the legislation, specifically on political parties, being the gatekeepers of democracy, can affect the participation of women in decision-making processes. We've been working on the reform agenda for the parliament, on parliamentary integrity. We've been working with the uh, government and boy on gender equality. And this is just, we've been working with the civil society with the frontline defenders on trafficking in human, to prevent trafficking in human beings, and many, many other aspects that contribute to the reform agenda, not waiting for the times of peace. Because it's all in all, every element feeds into the promotion of gender equality. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge democratic institutions. Because the attack on Ukraine has been happening when democratic institutions are not in great shape. Yesterday, again, in, in Iceland, we learned that there is no national human rights institution in Iceland, and it's only being created, mm -hmm. which is also very important for the maintenance and promotion of the gender equality in any country, um, in the OEC region and beyond. And now what we see in many different states, in many different countries, is there is an overreach of, exec of the executive, hastily adopted legislation without proper consultation, without gender mainstreaming, uh, without, uh, with the weakened judiciary, with the violence against women politicians in particular who are taking the stance and making, sending very strong messages to strengthen the democratic institutions, to make them more gender sensitive. And this is all happening around us. And therefore, I'd like to really conclude with, the, with saluting the women's movements. Because behind every story, of a successful woman politician, of a successful woman civil society leader, there is, a women's, there is a women's movement behind it. And women's movements have been delivered capacity, and, and I think that this, this, having this meeting is one of such examples where everyone comes together. And this link between politicians, women politicians, and, uh, and citizens is something that needs to be cherished if we want to see more women in decision making. Cooperation and solidarity must be uplifted. And here I'd like to share a story because we often talk about solidarity in many meetings that concern gender equality. And sometimes um, you ask yourself a question, does it exist, does it really exist, solidarity? <laughs> and last, time, last year I was in New York and I met with uh, Phyllis Chester. Uh, she is a very well-known American feminist and an author of a book, Women in Humanity to Women. And we had a debate and an argument, and I really, really told her that my response is yes. I really do believe that women's solidarity exists. And to top it up, I really believe that this will save, solidarity will save humanity. And I would like to say thank you to all of you, because you're the personification of the solidarity. Nowadays, there are so many different struggles. So many different struggles that we need to fight, sometimes simultaneously. And to get the world out of trouble, we need to forge bold and compassionate alliances and to make this solidarity sustainable. Thank you.
sense uh, of how a big international organization has seen the start of their large-scale war in Ukraine, and more how this organization has seen the women's movement in Ukraine during these challenging times. Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irina, and uh, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be here. And to, to represent young women, to learn from you, to exchange the experience. Indeed, we are perceiving Iceland as the champion. However, over this couple of last days, we've seen that there are a lot of common challenges we have. The same challenges Iceland have, very much similar common challenges we have in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has taken thousands of lives. It caused a tremendous displacement. Millions of people left their homes. And the resulted in the unacceptable violation of human rights and international human law. It has tremendous global impacts on many countries globally. The war has caused the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War. The third, one third of the population of Ukraine had to leave their homes. Over 8 million people are now displaced and 90% of them are women and women with children. 5.4 million are internally displaced. 68% of them are women and women with children. UN assesses that nearly 18 million people, and this is actually 40% of the Ukrainian population, are now in need of humanitarian aid. And around 8 million of these figure again are women. Soil has a human face, but so does leadership. And we as UN women have seen it also during the COVID times, and we obviously see it during the war, that leadership is often driven by women. We in Union Women see it every day in our work with women politicians, with women activists, with civil society organizations, with women leaders. The rapid gender assessments which Union Women runs to assess the situation in the country and to see the needs of women and girls, they obviously demonstrate that women are playing a key role in the humanitarian response. But they are not fully involved in formal decision-making. Women CSOs and women volunteers, they are mobilizing themselves very quickly to ensure that their communities and IDPs they are dealing with, they receive support, they have access to services, they have food, meals, they are evacuated, especially when it comes to women with disabilities, children with disabilities, senior people in the communities. And our assessment showed that leadership of women in the decision-making at the family level and in their communities has increased during the war. Now women in the families have more voice, they have more to say, and they can influence the decision. However, at the formal decision making, we are seeing that the centralization of power and the masculinity of power. This is obvious because we are in the war times. This is very much military, we can explain that, despite the fact that there are 60,000 women are in the military now. It becomes more and more difficult for women to make influence in formal, political, and administrative decision-making. Women are not meaningfully participating, and I'm saying this because we have data and evidences and directly monitoring. I have to give credit to the Ukrainian government. Despite the ethnic war, in 2022, the government kept the gender equality as a high political agenda. The National Action Plan on Implementation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 was revised and adopted. We ratified the Istanbul Convention. We adopted the first ever gender equality strategy till 2030. There are progress in the legislation towards domestic violence, combating domestic violence. So there are a lot of things Ukraine politically and legally can be proud of. However, as I said, at the regional and local level, we see that women and their participation in decision making, it tends to be sidelined. They, their needs are not considered in the humanitarian assistance. Decisions are often made quickly and they do not adequately reflect the differentiated needs of women and men. And obviously they are different. Men and women have different needs during the conflict and during the war. And this is one of the key priorities for us as international organizations not only to provide the humanitarian and development work, but also to advocate and keep on pushing for women's participation in decision making at all levels. It requires joint efforts from all of us because we cannot do it ourselves. It requires joint efforts from all stakeholders, civil society, politicians, government, 
arts and development partners, activists and community leaders. And we know that Ukraine, and it was mentioned by a number of colleagues today already, that during the time of the war and the conflict, women are at the forefront. They're making decisions, they're driving the initiatives. However, when the conflict ends and the life tends to go back to normal in business, women are being pushed aside. And we've seen it in many countries after the Second World War. And it might happen in Ukraine. So this is the lesson we have to learn and to keep the push for advocating not for it to happen in the country. I think that Ukrainian women are demonstrating fabulous example of leadership and participation. Women volunteers, artists, doctors, defenders, politicians, leaders, they are united today as men in the world. They stand in line with women. And this is a short introduction for it, but I wanted to show you a short, very short video, yeah. um, just to visualize how the participation and unity of women is happening in Ukraine. Let's let's make it together and demonstrate leadership. for this inspirational video that confirms that uh, Ukrainian women are strong, brave, and unbreakable. And this brings me to our next speaker, who is the one of the best examples of such a, of young women in Ukraine, Angelika. Her story is a story of young women who was forced to uh, fled the, her hometown that, that is in the south uh, of Ukraine. But she uh, started to support 
continue to support Ukrainian women under these uh, circumstances. Antelika, the floor is yours. I have to remind that we have 15 minutes left, uh, and uh, uh, I, I suggest you will be in time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It is hard to, to talk after this video. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Ukrainian Women's Congress, to Ukrainian Women, OSCE, and partners from Iceland. Uh, site for organizing important event for Ukrainian women. February 24th uh, last year was the most terrible day for me as for many Ukrainian people. This fear, fear, powerlessness, difficult decisions, a choice to stay or go into the unknown, but in search of the safe place. I went to Hungary with my daughter and my colleague, and we lived in the offices of our partners, and later my relatives joined me, and we were six women. Um, my mom, my granny, my sister, my niece, me and my daughter, and the kind women from, woman from Hungary who didn't know me before. Uh, she provided us with accommodation. And um, from the first day of the evacuation, I felt guilty. I am safe, but millions of Ukrainians need help and remain in Ukraine. Therefore, I started, I began to use my skills to help Ukraine. Um, I've been working with empowerment of Roma community for eight years. Um, and I started to write the projects and fundraise to attract partners and lobby in other uh, European countries for funding to Ukrainian organizations, especially for local organizations, to talk about Ukraine and their invasion in our territory by Russia. A full-scale war, not a conflict. Um, I started to ask a weapon and um, ammunition for Ukrainian soldiers. Um, it was events, UN events, Council of Europe, women congresses together with, the, with our team of Ukrainian Women's Congress. In March last year, our organization, my organization Voices from Me, um, started with a team of four people and three volunteers, distributed humanitarian aid, food, hygiene, blankets, baby food, dignity kits for women, and evacuated people from the Zaporizhia region, from my hometown. I returned to Ukraine in the fall and started building a team in the regions. Uh, and today there are almost 50 of us. We are working in the south, east, west, and central parts of Ukraine in, in seven cities. Our focus as a Roma organization is a help to Roma community who are the most discriminated minority in Europe. But our slogan is to help uh, everyone without prejudice. So our services are available to everyone who needs it. Our main projects are the provision of multi-purpose cash assistance, uh, humanitarian aid in the frontline territories, legal and psychological consultations, children's spaces for access to distance learning due to the war in the frontline territories, as Lena Kondratyuk mentioned before, Schools are closed, and um, developmental classes, psychological consultations, many children come with PTSD, adaptations, problems due to replacement, uh, neurostic fears due to the war. And one of them, our beneficiaries, is a six-year-old boy who was at the station, at the railway stations, station in Kramatorsk, the Donetsk region. And so, have a Russian missile killed 61 people, including seven children, who were trying to evacuate. Our psychologist helped him to get rid of nervous tick. We also created women's spaces place of power, where IDP internally displaced women and women from vulnerable categories can get career consult, 
counseling, get a new specialty in the fields of beauty industry, public, um, catering, sewing courses, and get a starter cure kit to, for a quick start of practice. Attend yoga or stretching to improve their physical, psycho-emotional state. Get business consultation and a startup to develop their own businesses. And um, many women lost their jobs because they moved to the safe regions, western part of Ukraine. Many of them worked in industrial cities and cannot work in their specialty simply because they are not, there are no such enterprises in western part of Ukraine. One of the participants of our project worked at a metallurgical enterprise in the Kharkiv region and she left her hometown with her two children when the Russian started bombing from, av from aviation. And now she is an internally displaced uh, woman in the western part of Ukraine. And in our pro project, she obtained a specialty of hairdresser. It was her dream. And she found a community of people who support each other. And um, it was my idea to, to be the friend, to be the supporter as eight months ago, Hilda from Hungary helped me to live in her, and she provided um, free for free accommodation for me. And I wanted to be this woman for other women um, who need help. I create such projects and initiatives because I went through this evacuation and migration, became an internally displaced woman with children. Because I belong to the Roma national minority, this helps me to understand the needs of our target audience with whom we are working. Relentless work, understanding the context, uniting people around, helping others help to grow. As a leader, I grow as a leader and my team during this year. Currently about two that about 20,000 people have received help from our organization. Our donors are powerful international organizations. Oxfam, World Food Program, UN Women, Eastern European Foundation, Center for Disaster Philanthropy, Global Fund for Children, Kinder Not Healed, the Mercy Corps. I know that my story, it is one of thousands of stories of unbreakable Ukrainian women who work tirelessly to help Ukraine and Ukrainians. Every woman, every woman in my environment is involved in volunteering and here is all these women. Um, and um, I know that my experience and expertise as other women leaders of their communities communities are important and will help Ukraine in the early recovery processes and I'm ready and should participate in the reconstruction and recovery processes after our victory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Angelika for uh, your leadership that you demonstrates and thank you for becoming for becoming a part of uh, for your willingness for becoming a part of the uh, further reconstruction effort of Ukraine. Now we are going to our friends from Iceland and uh, we would like to uh, hear from you your reflection on you what have heard and maybe your ideas on how we can be uh, cooperating together. I uh, will give the floor to Torun, uh, who is a member of the parliament. The floor is yours, I will, I will yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, it's a great honor to be here with you today and listen to you know, what the magnificent work that you are doing in Ukraine. Um, I am aware of the time limit. I think there's a new session starting yes. in three minutes yes. here. Yes. Um, uh, but it's our session, and we will lay, okay. like continue, okay. continue you're there. You're in charge. Yeah. You're in charge. Thank yeah. you. Um, I really have to be honest. I'm not sure what to add to what has been said here because you have kind of um, encapsulated what war does to women and children. Yeah. 
and of course to whole societies. Um, and I, I am inspired by the fact that you are all focused on reconstruction, you are all focused on a structure that is hopefully one that will not be another patriarchal, patriarchal society, because we all know that women can be useful in wartime, yes. and then they are thrown out of the system. And I know it sounds very harsh, yeah. but this is the history of our times. So I am very inspired by the fact that you are so organized, and that you are looking ahead, and that you have the ideas for what will then continue when peace comes to Ukraine, yeah. how you want to continue in your society. Uh, because you all know, and we all know, that we need women everywhere. We need them in all stations of life. And they are, as we all know, the glue that, that holds society together. And I feel that from your accounts here that you have so visibly demonstrated how it is the women of Ukraine who are holding society together and during the last few years. Yeah. And during those, this horrendous invasion and the legal war. Um, so just one second. Let's just all keep in mind that we will not have any democracy uh, without full participation of women. Otherwise, we cannot call societies democracies. If there's not full participation of women, we stand with you. We will stand with you for as long as it takes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thanks. And thank you all so much uh, for sharing your experiences and the amazing work that you are doing um, in this difficult time. You spoke about Iceland as a, as a role model. Um, and I hope that you know that you were all role models for, for <laughs> us uh, as well. Uh, but there is, a, there is a huge importance in, in role models. And also remember that you were role models for all the young girls in Ukraine. Um, and to make sure that you, uh, that you uplift them while you're doing this work. Because they will be the ones that will continue the work that you are doing. Um, in general, we, of course we know inclusion of all, all genders and uh, leads to better decisions. <coughs> when women are at the table, better decisions get made. Um, and I think this also applies to other minorities. Um, so people like LGBTI people, uh, disabled people, Roma people, um, that the women's movement has been paramount in, in other countries to also uplift these minorities to, to, so that they also uh, get a seat at the table. And um, after you win the war, <laughs> make sure to remind people of your efforts and make sure to document your efforts as they are. I, I know that you're like, I can see that you're doing that. You are organized um, and strong. But uh, I just wanted to, I'm trying to be of, of some use, but it is, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I can be. Um, but I also think, you know, when, we, when it comes to doing something from here I've, and, and from other, other European countries where the Ukrainian women are displaced, I think that the women's movements in those countries should reach out to Ukrainian women um, and, and, you know, get them in, in, involved in ones that aren't already, uh, because we know they are, <laughs> um, and get them involved in the women's movements so that, so that this kind of um, grassroots pressure can, can also grow from, from outside of Ukraine and then one day all come back. Because as you uh, sort of said before, uh, women want to come back uh, once peace is there. Uh, and they, uh, that, that they are already on, on track towards full equality. Uh, yeah, so thank, thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you all of you.
Thank you all of us for being a part of this session. Uh, my suggestion is to have a five minute break and then we will get back and have uh, the, another part of our conversation about the best solutions for making the society gender, soci gender sensitive. So see you in a few minutes here in the same room.